Ladies and gentlemen, please again welcome tonight's Master of Ceremonies, General Dick Freimeyer. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, welcome to the Aviation Museum of Kentucky and the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame enshrinement for 2017. Aviation is essential to Kentucky. Not only does it extend our horizons, it also expands our economy. In addition to the thousands of jobs in the aviation industry itself, Aviation connects us with the world, bringing new commerce and industry to the Commonwealth and new opportunities for our citizens. While aviation is important to Kentucky, our honorees show us that Kentucky is important to aviation. It's an honor to be with you this evening to celebrate our great aviation heritage. Each year, the Kentucky Aviation Achievement Award is given to a group or individual who show through their actions that they are worthy of being enshrined in the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame. The Association of Air Medical Services is an international trade association headquartered in Washington, D.C. Founded in 1980, it serves as an advocate on behalf of its membership to enhance their ability to deliver quality, safe, and effective medical care and medical transportation for every patient in need. The Kentucky chapter of the AAMS represents those companies who provide life-saving air medical service to the citizens of the Commonwealth, and over the years, the medical services being provided have definitely improved. Before the 1970s, there was a good chance that if you had been involved in an automobile accident or some other type of medical emergency, a hearse from the local funeral parlor would come and take you to the hospital. They would be called on to serve as the city's ambulance. Run by the local funeral home, they were typically the only vehicles large enough to carry someone in a stretcher. In 1966, Congress passed the Highway Safety Act, which established new regulations for emergency care personnel. In passing that law, the entire landscape for highway safety and the business of providing emergency medical care changed, but it did not happen quickly. In Kentucky, it was not until 1974 that the state legislature required certification as an EMT, emergency medical technician, to work as an ambulance attendant. Before that, the only requirement that you had to have was a driver's license. Fast forward to today, and the environment for providing emergency medical care has vastly changed. Ambulances and their crews have vastly improved. New and more rapid methods of delivering patients to a care facility are now widely accepted and expected. The use of civilian helicopters for transport of ill and injured patients has become an integral part of modern emergency care. Helicopter transport of emergency patients in the United States evolved from experience gained in the Korean and Vietnam Wars when injured soldiers were transported from conflict areas to military medical facilities for definitive care. And whether it's to pick up a patient at the site of a serious accident or to transport a critical care patient from one medical facility to another, better suited for their treatment, the use of air medical services is now an everyday occurrence. The initial impetus for this development and proliferation of civilian helicopter ambulances was based on the concept of the golden hour. First described by Dr. R. Adams Cowley, considered the father of trauma medicine, he defined that a severe trauma patient had 60 minutes or less from the time of injury to receive specialized treatment to reduce mortality. But the decision to transport a critical care patient by air ambulance isn't just about getting them to the hospital in as little time as possible. Indeed, air ambulance services are known for their ability to provide a high level of care while the patient is on board, often with advanced medical equipment that is not in wide usage on ground ambulances. The best air ambulance services will have highly trained specialists on board the aircraft who can attend to a critical care patient's needs before the patient even arrives at the destination hospital. In the golden hour, this factor alone can be a potential lifesaver. While helicopters responding to accident sites can be visually spectacular, there's another task where the service really shines, and that's in the area of organ transplants. At any given time in this country, there are tens of thousands of Americans in urgent need of organs from donors. 
Because organs can remain healthy for only a short period of time following their recovery from a donor, it's crucial that the newly donated organ be moved as quickly and safely as possible. According to organdonor.gov, 75% of organs go to local patients after their recovery. Still, the meaning of local in relation to a mode of transportation can vary. But if you are in Ashland and there's a donor match from Paducah, the use of an air medical service to transport the organs can be easily justified. Just as in the case of transporting a living, breathing patient, the experienced, highly trained air medical staff as well as the advanced medical equipment found on board the best air ambulances are absolutely crucial to ensuring that an organ arrives in perfect condition. There is no doubt that over the years, the medical services being provided in Kentucky have definitely improved. It is therefore fitting that the Kentucky chapter of the Association of Air Medical Service, in recognition of its dedication providing exemplary medical services to the citizens of the Commonwealth, that it receives the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame 2017 Aviation Achievement Award. The Kentucky chapter of the Association of Air Medical Services is represented tonight by its president and secretary, Joe Mekna is the area manager for Air Methods Kentucky. He started his career as a paramedic in 2001 and in 2011 began his aviation career as a flight paramedic. He has served as president of Kentucky Ames since 2015. Josh Brands is the business operations manager for FI or PHI, Kentucky Air Medical. He is a certified medical transport executive and serves as the secretary of Kentucky Ames. Please welcome Joe and Josh. Good evening and thank you. This is truly an honor and, and I have to say that it is truly an honor to be part of such a wonderful organization. Um, I've, as the video said, was honored to, uh, to be a part of it in 2011 and uh, have grown and was offered in 2015 to take the position as, as president for the uh, local chapter. And uh, it is, is definitely it's something that I enjoy. And I want to give a shout out to uh, those that make it possible. And, and that includes our wives. Uh, my beautiful wife is back in the, the uh, hall today and I uh, appreciate her being here and supporting us throughout the time. And uh, I'm going to let Josh say a few words as well. Thank you. Uh, as Joe said, it is an honor for us to be here. Um, a few things about what Ames does, uh, not as just a national level, but at a, as a state level with Kentucky, is that we're able to work together with other organizations uh, that are responsible for making sure that our families, our friends, and the citizens of our community make it home safe. Um, we spend a lot of time working on safety aspects, on making sure that we're all sharing landing zones. Uh, to make sure that the, the areas that we're landing on aren't always the roadways that the pictures and the depict. Um, these are things that, uh, that we share that we find it valuable to not hold close to the vest because what it does is when we don't share those, it impacts the families across the Commonwealth. And so uh, we're very fortunate uh, to be part of Ames and um, we, f we take great pride in making sure that every, uh, every mission that our crews go out on uh, they return safely and make sure that the, the families that you all have and that we have and that our, our employees have, that they all make it home safe. And uh, like I said, we thank you all and um, enjoy your dinner. Thank you, Joe and Josh. Uh, let us now honor those Kentuckians who have been selected for enshrinement into the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame by their work, their leadership, and perseverance. They have enhanced the Commonwealth's contributions to aviation and aerospace. When looking at the accomplishments of people who are considered for the Hall of Fame, we take into account the many aspects of their lives. For our first enshrinee, Dr. Gail Alexander, we see an individual 
who had the desire to be the best he could be in anything that he did. He learned to fly before he could drive. His insistence as a pilot that his crew always wear parachutes and be prepared to exit a damaged airplane led directly to the lives of his B-17 crew being saved when it was blown out of the sky over and on a mission over Germany. He was determined to survive as a prisoner of war in Germany. And when he returned, war, or returned home, the love that he had for animals led him to become a large animal veterinarian. Ladies and gentlemen, some of the moments of the life of Gail Alexander. This Hall of Fame enshrinee could be called an achiever, a doer, a leader, successful, a high flyer, and yes, a hero. He would just say he was doing his job. Vernon Gail Alexander was born October 26, 1921 in Lexington, Kentucky. His mother, C.A., was a secretary for a horse farm operation, and his father, Harry, was a pharmacist. Gail's only sibling was older, a brother named Harry, who later became a pilot and Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. In 1927, at age six, Gail saw Charles Lindbergh in Lexington, and he was forever attracted to aviation. At age nine, Gail shadowed Dr. R. L. Pontius while taking care of animals. It was then that he decided he wanted to become a veterinarian. In 1936, at age 15, with the love and support of his grandmother, Gail took his first flying lesson. Showing great aptitude, he soloed after his second lesson. After completing his cross country, Gail was awarded his pilot's license after only taking three lessons. He would say that he was just doing his job. While attending the University of Kentucky, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, prompting Gale to enlist in the United States Army. After earning his wings in October 1942 and being the best of his class, Gale was assigned to be a flight instructor. He taught in the AT-6 for over a year, but his real goal was to become a fighter pilot. He asked a high-level connection of his grandmother's for a transfer to fighters. He was reassigned, but to his surprise, it was as a flight instructor on the B-24, a four-engine bomber. 22 months later, he was assigned for training on a B-24 crew. Coincidentally, his brother Harry was in command. Harry did try to get Gale assigned to the P-38 fighter squadron, but the orders were rescinded due to the serious need for bomber pilots. Gale was assigned as the lead pilot with a B-24, which he named the Kentucky Cloudhopper. He and crew were stationed with the 8th Air Force 493rd Bomb Group in Ipswich, England. His first mission was D-Day, June 6, 1944, flying over France. Like a personal signature, Gale ordered and enforced that his entire crew wear their parachutes, which were often clumsy and awkward. Even though not popular, this command would later prove to be monumental and life-saving. He would say that he was just doing his job. After flying six combat missions, Gale was singled out and assigned to the Royal Air Force. He was trained to fly a Pathfinder B-24 and later a B-17G that was fitted with a radar pod. They would refer to this kind of aircraft as a Mickey ship. Its intent use was to fly in front of the formation to facilitate critical precision bombing by locating the target using radar. A high-level officer, usually a colonel or general, was required to fly with the Pathfinder bomber to oversee the munitions release. Consequently, all of the other bombers behind them had their command to drop their bombs on the Pathfinder's queue. Gale led his crew on his 7th through 19th missions as one of these Pathfinder missions. On the 19th mission, on November 2nd, 1944, Gale was leading three bomb groups consisting of 1,200 aircraft over a synthetic fuel plant in Merlesburg, Germany. 63 bombers would be lost on that mission. One of them was Gale's B-17. Because of Gale's order to have his crew wear their parachutes, seven of them survived. Unfortunately, four more did not. He had been flying at 26,000 feet when an anti-aircraft shell exploded on his wing between engine two and the fuselage where the fuel tank was located. He was blown out of the plane. He was captured by two German soldiers and forced to march in two feet of snow. He was barefoot as his boots had been blown off during the explosion. After several miles, all three were exhausted, particularly Gale. The soldier behind Gale had taken to poking him in the back to the skin with a bayonet, 
to the point that Gale grabbed the bayonet with his bare hand and in no uncertain terms, harshly admonished the soldier to stop. The soldier stopped. After being interned at Stalag 3, he was forced to join 6,000 other prisoners on a 550-mile death march during one of the coldest winters in German history. He survived and was liberated April 29, 1945. Once home, Gale earned a DVM from Ohio State University in 1949. Establishing a successful small animal hospital, he practiced veterinary medicine, specializing in large animals and provided expertise to the horse, cattle and breeding industries. Retiring in 1976, Gale worked on his farm in Jessamine County until 2015. Gale's medals, awards and recognitions have been many, with the most recent being the highest decoration bestowed by France, the French Legion of Honor for his service during the war. Aren't we fortunate that the men and women of the United States Armed Forces, like Dr. Alexander, are living their lives and just doing their jobs? It is therefore fitting that Dr. Vernon Gale Alexander be enshrined into the official aviation hall of fame of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Gail Alexander's nomination to the Hall of Fame was submitted by his friend, Dr. William Lee, who will be his presenter tonight. Dr. Alexander had planned to attend tonight's event, but a recent fall has prevented his attendance. Museum trustee, Louis Bosworth, had the pleasure of working with Dr. Alexander on tonight's presentation and will be receiving the award on his behalf. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Bill Lee. Thank you. I am Bill Lee, a dentist here in Lexington, Kentucky. It is my honor to place the name of Dr. Gail Alexander into consideration for the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame. I've known Dr. Alexander all my life. First, as a colleague of my father's, who had a small, they both were veterinarians here in Lexington, and both had uh, small animal practices not too far from each other. Secondly, I got to know Dr. Alexander as a father, because I went to high school, Henry Clay High School, with his two children. However, I really got to know him as an adult when he started to come to me in my dental office. Over the years, I, got to, I learned that Dr. Alexander was a gentleman, a family man, a farmer, a fisherman, a hunter, an investor, an avid reader, a historian, a philosopher, and most importantly, a talker. I mean this in the most sincere and positive way, but I remember some of the most fascinating, fascinating conversations with Dr. Alexander it was where I'd never hardly said a word. His wealth of knowledge and his clarity of vision really are remarkable. Now, Dr. Alexander isn't a frequent patient of mine, but when I do see him, I know it's usually for something he can't fix himself. I make sure we have extra time in our schedule for his visit because usually he comes in with a story. He usually has self-diagnosed his issue and using his veterinary background, uh, he kind of wants to see if he's gotten his, gotten his diagnosis right. Usually he has. Uh, now he does have a very dry sense of humor, if you know him. Uh, one visit years ago, he was in my office, what he thought was an abscessed tooth. He went into a story with a twinkle in his eye about how a client of his brought his exotic talking parrot into his office who had stopped talking. Now, upon examination, Dr. Alexander discovered that this parrot had an abscess, and after a root canal, the parrot started talking again. Dr. Alexander was waiting to see how long it would take me to realize that birds don't have teeth. 
Now, my parents divorced when I was young. Both remarried and my dad moved away. My mom and stepfather had developed a new hobby over the next 50 years of buying and selling houses, mostly here in Lexington. Three years ago, their adventures landed them in a house next door to Dr. Alexander's. As they got to know their neighbor, my mother told me that I need to get Louie to get Dr. Alexander into this Hall of Fame. I said, okay, why? Only then did I realize uh, the, the fully understand the accomplishments of this man. I missed the deadline last year, but with Louie's help, I'm thrilled that he's being honored this year. I am disappointed that he can't be here tonight, but he did take a pretty nasty fall a few weeks ago, and he fell again Thursday. At 96 years old, his mind is still very, very sharp, but both legs are in casts, and he would be kind of uncomfortable here tonight. I'm most disappointed for you because you don't have the opportunity to meet this remarkable man. And now, here to accept the award on behalf of Dr. Alexander is Museum Board of Trustee member, my good friend, my best friend, Mr. Lewis Bosworth. Thanks for the time, brother. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Lewis Bosworth is now receiving the medallion inscribed in the name of V. Gail Alexander, who is now declared to be duly enshrined in the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame. Thank you. Great job. A close friend of mine, currently serving in the U.S. military with tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, recently spoke of what they in the service refer to as the give a care factor, except the word care is substituted for another four letter word beginning with S. Thank you. Giving a care is, a valu is valuable in training and generally when being present as when it is in unique situations where ordinary people do extraordinary things because they chose to give a care when others may have chosen not. For Gail Alexander, giving a care was a way of life. From his early flying years to military, and even in his profession, developing and perfecting particular veterinary procedures that brought about exemplary results for his patients and their owners. In putting together the information we saw in the DVD tonight, Dr. Alexander told me while he was a prisoner, he knew that Lexingtonian and friend of his B-17 pilot, Joe Houlihan, and also a former uh, neighbor of mine and Bill's, was in another Stalag building. Mr. Houlihan was emaciated, weak, and not doing well. Like something out of a movie, Dr. Alexander snuck out after dark beneath buildings under the watch of guards, dogs, and to check on Mr. Houlihan and offered him assurance and goodwill to, praise, to raise his spirits. My best friend and presenter Bill Lee also embodies one who lives a life of giving a care as he has been selected in for fellowship in the International College of Dentists, the American College of Dentists, and the Pierre Fourchard Academy. Currently, Bill is first vice president of the Kentucky Dental Association and is serving on the American Dental Association Council on annual sessions. The founders, volunteers, members of the Aviation Museum of Kentucky are also the ones that give a care or this wonderful treasure would not be here to serve the Commonwealth and beyond. Also, the airport, uh, the um, TAC Air and um, uh, 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 Mustang Aviation, our friends here, the same. And when you look around this room, you will see those who serve, who will serve, those who are currently serving, and those who have served, all with sacrifice. Certainly all show they give a care so we may enjoy the way of life today. So I wish Dr. Alexander and his family the best 
and we say we miss you tonight. I also say thank you to Dr. Alexander for, Alexander for doing his job and uh, for giving a care. Thank you also to the aforementioned. I am humbled beyond words to receive this great honor on behalf of Dr. Alexander. Thank you. We're always pleased when we look at the careers of our Hall of Fame and Shrinees at the excellence that they have attained through their careers. Major General Larry L. Henry had such a distinguished career with the United States Air Force. With over 320 combat missions in the F-4 Phantom, General Henry, with his 30 years of service in the Air Force, was always one of the best of the best. Ladies and gentlemen, let's see a few of his accomplishments as we review the life of Major General Larry L. Henry. Mark Twain once said, the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. For General Larry Henry, the first important day was in Mount Sterling, Kentucky in 1941. Larry's mother, Natalie, was a school teacher and his father, Earl, owned the Jersey Milk Company. The Henrys moved to Lexington when Larry was a junior in high school. He played on the basketball and football teams at Lafayette High School and was active in Boy Scouts where he earned his Eagle Scout Award. After high school, Larry attended the University of Kentucky where he joined the Air Force ROTC program and Sigma Alpha Epsilon fraternity. In 1964, he graduated with a BS in business and received his commission in the U.S. Air Force. His first duty station was Rhine Main Air Base in Germany, where he became the operations officer at the Armed Forces Courier Station. While at Rhine Main, he traveled extensively throughout Europe, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Larry also found time to coach the Rhine Main Rockets to the Air Force Basketball Championship. During his travels, Larry met Brenda, a Pan Am Airways stewardess. They fell in love and got married. They have been married for 50 years, and he's got four children. His next assignment was to command the Special Operating Location 1505 at Benoit Air Base in South Vietnam. He received a Bronze Star with Valor Device and Oak Leaf Cluster, as well as a Purple Heart for wounds defending the base during the 1968 Tet Offensive. Larry was nearing the end of his active duty commitment when several of the pilots in the 90th Tactical Fighter Squadron made a recommendation that he be offered a ride along in an F-100 Sabre. Larry got the approval and the flight was a life-changing experience. He liked flying and the wing commander recommended that he go to flight school. So when Larry returned to the United States in June 1968, he began navigator training at Mather Air Force Base, California with the 35th 35th Navigator Training Wing. Upon graduation, he completed F-4 tactical fighter training at Davis Monathan Air Base in Arizona and was assigned as a fast forward air controller with the 13th Tactical Fighter Squadron. The 13th was flying F-4s out of Udorn to attack targets in Laos and North Vietnam. He received one of his distinguished flying crosses for heroism in the Shantae prison raid of 1971. This daring raid was an attempt to free as many as 100 POWs from a jungle prison deep inside North Vietnam and only 23 miles from Hanoi. He returned to the U.S. and was signed to the 334 TAC Fighter Squadron at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in North Carolina. His squadron was deployed twice to Ubon Air Force Base in Thailand to fly linebacker missions against North Vietnam. It was on the return from one of these missions that his wingman was shot down by a surface-to-air missile. Larry and the pilot of their F-4 disregarded their personal safety to remain over the downed crewman's position to direct search and rescue forces. Their tenacious efforts resulted in the successful recovery of the crew members from hostile territory amid a constant barrage of enemy fire. Larry Henry served four combat tours in Vietnam where he flew 320 combat missions. His combat awards include two Distinguished Service Medals, the Silver Star, three Legion of Merit, seven Distinguished Flying Crosses with H for Heroism, two Bronze Stars for Valor, a Purple Heart, three Metorious Service Medals, 28 Air Medals, and an Air Force Commendation Presidential Unit Citation, Joint Meritorious Service Award, two Air Force Outstanding Unit Awards, two National Defense Service Medals, 
five Vietnam service medals and two Vietnam gallantry crosses. After his combat tours, he attended the prestigious United States Air Force Fighter Weapons School at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada, where he was awarded the Outstanding Graduate Trophy. He was next assigned to Air Crew Evaluation Division at Headquarters Pacific Air Command at Hickam Air Force Base, Hawaii, where he served as a Fighter Division Chief. In 1978, Larry attended the Air Force Command and Staff College at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. He was selected early for Lieutenant Colonel and distinguished himself as the outstanding graduate. It was also in 1978 that Larry earned a master's degree in personnel management from Troy University. Larry continued to distinguish himself as a superb leader in subsequent assignments to the 3rd Tactical Fighter Squadron. In 1982, he was selected as one of only 20 Air Force officers to attend the National War College. He served as Division Chief for Air Force Weapons at the Pentagon, where he was selected for early promotion to Colonel. In 1985, he was assigned to command the 37th Tactical Fighter Wing, also at George Air Force Base. He was selected early for promotions to Brigadier General in 1987, and in 1989, he accepted his next command as Inspector General of the Tactical Air Command at Langley Air Force Base, Virginia. In 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and General Henry was deployed to Headquarters Central Air Command as Chief of the Electronic Combat Division. He was instrumental in the planning of the Desert Storm Air Campaign, which turned out to be one of the most successful air campaigns in U.S. Air Force history. After the Gulf War, he served as Director of Plans, Programs, and Requirements for the Air Training Command and was promoted to Major General. In 1992, General Henry returned to the Pentagon as Director of the United States Air Force Requirements and Acting Deputy Chief of Staff for the Air Force Plans and Operations and also attended Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Larry Henry retired from active military duty in 1994. He would continue to serve in corporations that supported our military, first as Corporate Vice President for Training at Laurel Corporation and Lockheed Martin, and then at L3 Corporation as Vice President of Air Force Programs. Major General Larry L. Henry has served our country with valor and honor, and he has demonstrated excellent management in industry and is a source of pride for the Commonwealth of Kentucky and our nation. It is therefore fitting that Major General Larry L. Henry be enshrined into the official Aviation Hall of Fame of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. General Henry's presenter tonight is his lifelong friend, Bill Pirat. Their friendship began in Mount Sterling, playing basketball and football, continued into college where they roomed together and joined the same fraternity. We ask that our enshrinees select a presenter that can not only speak about the person, that can speak about the person and not just about their accomplishments. Bill, Bill P. Rat is such a person. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Bill P. Rat. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really honored to be here, <coughs> excuse me, to present this honor to uh, my lifelong friend, Larry Henry. Larry and I grew up in Mount Sterling, Kentucky, born the same year. We had a lot of the same interests as we started growing up. And uh, here are the few memories that I have of Larry and I in our little town. I remember Larry and I riding behind the Jersey Milk Company truck and delivering milk behind Larry's dad who owned the Jersey Milk Company. I remember, I remember uh, our tutelage under Bain Tiny Jones teaching fundamentals for basketball, football. He taught many other things to us in his biology classes, too. Now, there's some things that Tiny did that I'm not going to mention tonight. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, many, many memories. We played Army a lot and Soldier. We were growing up. And it seemed like Larry would always end up winning the battles. I've got a couple of, a couple of short stories. 
share. My grandkids love for me to tell this story. Dick Fuller's here tonight, and he can, I might embellish it a little, Dick, but here, here it goes. It's called the Bat Story. So in a small town, we had to invent what, what, or what we're going to do and, and have fun with and, and stay active. So one day, we're down at Dick's dad's tire and appliance business, and we're hanging around. He's trying to run us off, and a bunch of us. And Dick had this grand idea. He said, why don't we go up in the attic and kill some bats? We thought that was a pretty good idea. So we go up into the old attic, and we go, go upstairs. And on the way up, we got some sticks and some broom handles. And Dick said they're broom handles. I thought we had tobacco sticks, but it doesn't matter. And so we get up there in the attic, and uh, we said, Larry, take that broomstick and run it through those roof rafters and stir up those bats. And so there he does, and he runs it up through there, and the bats are all in there just covering the, the attic, and we're swinging and knocking them down and knocking them down. And uh, we must have killed a couple dozen bats. And so one got on Larry's ear, and we had to take time out to detach that thing from his ear. And uh, so we, we continued on after the melee and the dust settled and everything. Now, what are we going to do with all these dead bats? And Fuller had this idea. I think it was Fuller. I'm going to blame it on you anyway. He said, let's go up through the skylight, go up on the roof, and we'll put, it, put these bats in this big jar, and we'll, we'll go up over and we'll drop these dead bats down on Main Street while everybody's walking along there. So we'd, we'd go up there and we'd take these dead bats and we'd drop them and these little ladies, they're walking up and down Main Street and oh, they're screaming and hollering, bats, dead bats falling out of the sky. Well, news passes fast in a small town and the sheriff got notice. Frederick, well, he was a little fat guy and Larry says, and Dick says, uh, well, he's too fat to get up through the skylight. And he, he's not going to catch us because we can outrun him. So Dick says, I know how we can get out of here. So we, we'll go across the buildings, the roofs of the buildings, and I know where a fire escape is. And so we do that. We thought, man, we've got it made now. We're out of here. And so we go down the fire escape. And then as soon as we got to the bottom, who comes around the corner? The sheriff. He caught us. Boys, and he gave us a, he gave us a talking to, and he said, I'm going to send all of you to reform school. And, uh, well, we thought he was serious, and he told us all to go home and everything. Well, it turned out, of course, we didn't have to go to reform school. He was just trying to scare us. One other story that I have that I remember, and I've got many, many, but I'll keep it short. Larry and I used to fish a lot with Dick and, and a lot of our other buddies, and one day we decided to get, our, get on our bikes and go out to Howard's Mill to fish. And we're going out the road, and I guess we're racing, trying one beat the other. And uh, we turned around this corner, and Larry was going so fast that he, he lost control of the bike and he went over this fence. And he tumbled, and the bike went this way, and the fishing tackle here, and the pole here, and he's laying in this yard, this side yard of this lady. And we're all trying to, are you all right? Are you all right? And this little lady was up there, and she looked out the window of her house, and she was stirring something. And she says, are you dead? <laughs> and that nickname stayed with Larry <laughs> for many, many months after that. We all called him R.G. Dead. <laughs> and lastly, we spent a lot of time with Boy Scouts. And a small town, a lot of the guys, you know, we all were scouts. And we had a great reservation just out of sight outside of Mount Sterling called McKee Scout Reservation. And uh, we would go out there and uh, camp and build fires and learn all the things scouts learn about uh, being a scout. And uh, 
hiking up to Pilot's Knob where you could see Mount Sterling and Winchester on a clear day. And so after a while, a lot of us started dropping out of the scouts and uh, not Larry, he goes on to become an Eagle Scout. Well, it's certainly not surprising that he went on to have such a distinguished career in the military. And I am honored and pleased to uh, present Larry uh, tonight for his induction into the Aviation Museum Hall of Fame. Thank you very much. I think I'm supposed to put this around your neck. Damn. <laughs> and knock your, not knock your glasses off. <laughs> that was my instructions. That do all right. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Major General Larry L. Henry is now receiving the medallion inscribed in his name and is declared to be duly enshrined in the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame. I have to say, uh, I didn't know what Bill was going to say, so I was a little bit leery, and I was very glad to be behind the screen, so that if it was real bad, I could hide. Uh, unfortunately, uh, or I guess fortunately, there are several people in the audience uh, that if they'd had the chance to tell some stories, uh, I probably would have had to stay back there. Uh, I want to thank the uh, Kentucky uh, Aviation Museum for putting on this uh, tonight and uh, for hosting the event. And especially I'd like to thank uh, my contact, Larry Mitchum, who did a great job in getting me ready for this. I want to thank uh, all of you for coming. Uh, my family, uh, I've got uh, four kids, four grandkids, my sister and my long-term neighbor, Carolyn, here. And uh, a lot of people that I grew up with uh, that have been my friends uh, through high school, grade school, college uh, and, and numerous other adventures. And uh, they've all been friends for life. It's really humbling to be up here tonight because uh, I never expected any, uh, to be here, to be, tell you the truth. Uh, but to be honored tonight along with uh, all these heroes. I'm real sorry that Dr. Alexander couldn't be here because he's a true World War II hero. Uh, and I guess the video uh, and, and Bill gave a snapshot of, uh, of my life uh, so far. And uh, it's pretty uh, humbling to, to, to hear all that. Uh, my success is a, is true is is really uh, due and, and and in tribute to the great airmen uh, that I served with, fought with, some died with. Uh, although I was wounded, I was I was lucky. Uh, seeing that uh, helicopter with the Red Cross on it brought back uh, a few memories. But I was lucky. A lot of my buds didn't make it home. Some are, are still missing. I'm very happy to see our new servicemen and vets coming home to be treated with the honor and respect they deserve. It's a lot different than what we got when we came home from the Vietnam War 
And I'm sure there are a lot of people here that remember that. I've been asked, I cannot tell you how many times, and my wife has been asked, why did you go back to Vietnam four times? The answer is that I, along with my buddies, never lost faith in our country. And that faith has never left me. And we don't talk about it very much, but we believe in America. I know that the world that we live in today, sometimes it's very hard to believe in the American core values that make us Americans. But I want to tell you something. There's still a lot of heroes out there. So don't lose the faith. It's still there. And we can make it. Um, my greatest hero is only five feet tall. and barely weighs 100 pounds soaking wet. But she's been with me through thick and thin. Four combat tours in Vietnam, the Gulf War, various overseas tours where she had to drag the family around, my lengthy hospital stays, four typhoons, and three hurricanes. Through it all, she held the family together. I'll close by hoping that uh, God blesses all of you as I've been blessed. And I hope that God will continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you all for coming tonight, and good night. We have a message from an old friend of General Henry's, who is also an Ashrani of the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame. And I'll read that letter. 11 November 2017, Major General Larry Henry, I'm extremely pleased that the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame is recognizing this true Kentucky air warrior tonight. For in my mind, it is the recognition that is long overdue. I feel qualified to say that as I was then Captain Henry's wartime squadron commander and personally picked him to fly some of the toughest combat missions when I needed the first team. Kentucky can be very proud of this native son who in the war demonstrated great courage under enemy fire and then a unique wisdom in working key Air Force issues at the highest level in our Department of Defense. To General Henry, I say with you, it was an honor to have served, and I render a proud salute as you are enshrined in the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame. General Jack Gregory. Thank you again. During World War II, the concept of radar intercept night fighting with aircraft was new. So new, in fact, that the methods and procedures were considered top secret. Any new concept had to start somewhere and for the Marines, the rules were conceived by our next enshrinee, Marion Milton Magruder. 
starting with what the Royal Air Force had learned from their experience in fighting the German Luftwaffe in World War II, Magruder created an enhanced operational syllabus that would be used by Marines for night fighting procedures for years after. Let's spend a few moments reviewing the life of Colonel Milton Marion Magruder. Marion Milton Magruder was born in Lexington, Kentucky to parents William Marion and Augusta Tong Magruder in June 1911. He graduated with honors from the University of Kentucky in 1936 with a BA in psychology. A member of the university's ROTC program, he accepted the commission of second lieutenant in the United States Marines. Magruder reported for flight school in July 1938 to Naval Air Station Pensacola. After graduating, he was promoted to first lieutenant and was assigned to Marine Fighter Squadron VMF-1 at Marine Corps Station, Quantico, Virginia. It was at this time that he met and married Martha Ann Kelly of Lexington. Over the years, they have had five children. Over the next four years, and with the country now at war, his efforts and dedication earned him the rank of major by August 1942. The United States Navy had a critical need to establish an effective night fighting capability for the Pacific Campaign. Radar was in its infancy at the beginning of World War II, but already an essential part of Britain's air defense system. The Americans turned to the RAF, who had expert night fighters, fresh from battles with Germany. The U.S. hoped that Britain would be able to lend some of these squadrons, but unfortunately they could not. What the RAF could offer, however, was training. On February 6, 1943, Magruder and three other pilots were deployed to England for a 90-day stint to learn as much as possible about radar intercept night flying from the RAF. The British aircraft, configured for night fighting, had the radar operator sit next to the pilot. The U.S., on the other hand, needed to be able to work with only one pilot in a single-engine aircraft that was capable of operating from a carrier. Once back in America, Magruder received orders to rewrite the British methods to fit the U.S. Navy, which he did in 10 days. It was almost a totally different operational syllabus. Magruder's doctrine dictated that a night fighter squadron should be configured to operate as a standalone unit so it could be quickly deployed to the rapidly changing combat arenas when most needed at the beginning of hostilities. All they required was a runway to operate from. In June 1943, Magruder was assigned as a night fighter training officer at the newly formed Marine Aircraft Group 53 at Marine Corps Air Station, Cherry Point, North Carolina. Three months later in October, Major Magruder became the commanding officer of the newly formed VMF N533, which eventually would take the nickname Black Max Killers. Now a lieutenant colonel, his was the first Marine Corps squadron to receive the 56F-3N Hellcat Night Fighter. It had an improved radar, the APS-6. It was simple to operate, having only six knobs, with a range of five miles, and weighed 250 pounds. After undergoing the radar intercept training program, the squadron deployed to the Marshall Islands in May of 1944 to take over night defense of the area. When the Americans stormed Okinawa on April 1, 1945, kicking off the biggest battle of the Pacific War and the Japanese forces dominating the night skies, Magruder was sent to Pearl Harbor for a crisis briefing. Also at the briefing was Admiral Kelly Turner, the commander of the Okinawa invasion force. However, Turner was not sold on Magruder's night fighters, telling him that the planes and technology were no damn good. Magruder responded, you give me 10 days in combat and I'll show you. With no carriers available to transport his squadron from the Marshals to Okinawa, he further astonished the brass when he pledged his men would fly there across 2,500 miles of ocean. Magruder and his men worked out the fuel and on May 7th, 15 F-6F Hellcat fighters took off along with two R-5C transport aircraft with support personnel. So precise were Magruder's calculations that his planes would land at refueling points with as little as four gallons of gasoline. On May 10th, they arrived in Okinawa, completing the longest overwater flight of single-engine fighters in the Pacific during World War II. The squadron was operational in 36 hours, taking off in the worst typhoon season in 200 years. Magruder and his squadron grabbed control of the night skies over Okinawa. 
They registered 35 enemy aircraft victories and one probable, all radar intercepts, which was almost as many aircraft destroyed as all three other night fighter squadrons on Okinawa combined. The battle for Okinawa was won in June, two months before the end of the war. VMF N533 was the top scoring night fighter squadron and had the best safety record and the highest combat ready rate for any operational squadron in the Pacific. In 15 months of overseas developments, the Killers logged over 11,000 flight hours. On July 8, 1945, Magruder transferred command of the VMF N533 to his executive officer and returned to the United States for a war bond tour. On August 31, 1961, Colonel Magruder retired from active duty after 26 years of service in the U.S. Marine Corps. In retirement, Magruder served on a number of national policy boards and organizations and was a lifelong Rotarian. He died on his 86th birthday, June 27, 1997, in Paradise Valley, Arizona. It is therefore fitting that Colonel Marion Milton Magruder be enshrined into the official Aviation Hall of Fame of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Colonel Magruder's son, Mark, is joining us this evening to accept the Hall of Fame medallion on behalf of his late father. An author, Mark wrote the biography about his father titled, Night Fighter, Ra Radar Intercept Killer. This is a must read for anyone who has an interest in marine aviation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mark Magruder. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Magruder is now receiving the medallion inscribed in the name of his father, Marion Milton Magruder, who is now declared to be duly enshrined in the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame. Thank you very much, everybody. I thought I'd just get up here and read this book, but then somebody told me that would be a little too long. So instead, <laughs> By the way, the uh, introduction was so well done, I want to give a round of applause to whoever put that together. I am honored to be here this evening representing my father, Colonel Marion M. Black Mac Magruder, serial number 05373, Naval Aviator 6008. I want to thank the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame for recognizing the excellence of my father. And to express my appreciation to Jim McCormick for all his invaluable assistance in this process. And everyone I have been in contact here at the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame have been so gracious and kind to me. You know, this is a big deal. I would like to recognize also my way much older brother, Marion Jr. <laughs> Stand up for a second, Mac. <laughs> and, his, and his lovely wife, Sandra. <laughs> he married way above his pay grade. And I would also like to recognize my brother, Michael, He's, he's older, but he's not way older. And, and stand up, Mike. My, brother, my brothers, Mac and Mike, came here to Kentucky to, with my mother to hold down the farm while my dad was off fighting in the Pacific. So they, they have a lot of stories that are really wonderful to tell, too. I regret to report that my brother my younger brother, Marshall, has passed away recently from cancer. And that my brother, my youngest brother, Merritt, who had to be an oops, because it was so far apart. He, and I can, I can joke about it because he's unable to be here tonight as well. I am so, also so blessed that my forever friends, Tom and Candy Spiel, are here with me to celebrate this incredible evening. They are truly my rock. 
Now, so much was spoken about in the introduction. I want to tell you a little bit about who was Marion Milton Magruder. My father and mother were both born and raised here in Lexington, Kentucky. His parents, William Marion Magruder and Augusta Tong Magruder, resided at 456 Rose Lane, and today that home belongs to UK. William owned the Magruder Brothers Furniture Store, along with acquiring a number of rentals for additional income. My dad, Marion, worked in the furniture store and delivered furniture to the customers. He was tough and suave. Nobody messed with him without paying a price. Marion was the third child of four children, Aileen, Eldon, my dad, and Jane. Early on, his mother wanted Marion referred to as Milton so that uh, he would escape ridicule, but he was tough anyway, so it didn't matter. My mother's parents were Clem and Popey Kelly. Clem was a highly respected attorney and judge, and they were quite prominent in the social scene, residing just outside of town. Martha was also the third sibling of four, Jack, Clemmy, my mother, and Tommy. And an interesting little sidelight, they were in the Guinness Book of Records for all being born on the same day, different years. So <laughs> back then, that was amazing. As my mom grew into a young lady, in those days, boys would come calling on the weekends as she would be sitting out on the veranda, and she was very, very popular. My mother also performed with the Billy Butterfield Band on many occasions. In fact, it turned out to be a toss-up whether she was going to marry my dad or take a life of singing. But dad lucked out. Martha was quite perplexed when those suitors suddenly stopped coming by. It turned out that was shortly after going out on a date with my dad. He let it be known there'd be nobody coming by anymore, that Martha was his. He grew up in Lexington with a number of people that many of you may well know. E.B. Foley grew up four doors away on Rose Lane and was a lifelong buddy. Dave Manley, Frex Rohr, Bill Patrick, Buddy Greyhouse were also close friends and mischief makers. They all attended Henry Clay High School. Solishan's Drug Store was on the corner of Limestone and Main and was the high school hangout just across from Henry Clay High School. My father played end on Coach Heber's football team, and at the time, Lafayette was the big rivalry back then. Mr. Skinner was the principal at Henry Clay. He got to know my father really well from pranks like my dad sp spreading manure on the hand railing to the stage where they would have convocations. Mr. Skinner was a large gentleman and needed to hold onto the rails to get up the stairs. During such gatherings, he would place firecrackers and lit cigarettes that would go off at odd times during the <laughs> occurrences. He snuck into the cafeteria when they accidentally left it open, found that they could, he could get into the ice cream. Well, he went and signaled his buddies in different classes to come out. And of course, they all needed to go to the bathroom. And so they all went into the cafeteria. And after they ate about as much ice cream as they could stand, they had the biggest ice cream fight in history. And Mr. Skinner heard them all yelling and laughing and opened the door to the cafeteria as a big blob of ice cream came zinging out just over his head. Well, my dad got in trouble for that. And then there was the time when he removed the door pins on the teacher's lavatory 
where old lady Maisie, the vice principal, happened to be sitting in there, and the door fell open right as the students were passing to their next classes, and she was in all her glory. Mr. Skinner know, knew who to <laughs> have report to his office. Well, he was expelled twice. And the third time, Mr. Skinner vowed he would never get to attend another high school in Lexington. And what happened was, one evening, E.B. Foley drove his car with a couple of the guys in it, and they, they went to Solishans, and they were all talking, and then E.B. opened up the glove box, and he had a brand new Colt 45 automatic. At that time, there were not very many of them in civilian hands. And they were all looking at it, and they were saying, well, boy, I could really shoot with this. And of course, my father said, I can outshoot all of you. And they said, well, you see that clock tower over, over there? Can you hit that clock? And he goes, give me that gun. Bam, bam. All of a sudden, the light on the clock tower went out, the hands stopped and they realized they were in trouble. So they buzzed away home. The next day in, at school, over the PA system, Mr. Skinner said, you know, there, there must be some subversives here in town. I'm gonna contact the FBI. At the end of the day, my dad had to go up and confess to what he had done. Well, of course, his father and mother were called down to the principal's office and his father had to pay for the clock. Now, I understand that Henry Clay has been torn down. All the years after that, one of the clock faces looked newer than the other. And that was my dad. So anyway, well, every time my dad tried to enroll into one of the high schools, the moment Mr. Skinner found out about it, he had him summarily ejected. And so it was his mother and the parish priest that finally outsmarted Mr. Skinner. They got my father enrolled into St. Catherine's all-girl Christian Academy, where he was the only male student. And by the skin of his teeth, he ended up graduating in 1932. Well, the Lexington leader heard about this and wrote a story because it was so unusual. Mr. Skinner called my father in and asked him to come see him. And when he did, Mr. Skinner said, you know, I don't often give advice to students about what they should do with their lives. But he said, in your case, I'm going to make an exception. I think that you should buy some coveralls, get a pick and shovel, and go down to the city and dig ditches. Well, my father thanked Mr. Skinner for his advice and went home. And his mother counseled him over the summer to enroll at UK, because it was just down the street. And she said, I don't want you someday to wish you had tried continuing education and not be able to do it. So that fall, he enrolled at UK. And one of the classes that he had to take as a freshman, male student, turned his life around. And it was ROTC. My dad loved military discipline. However, he was a little aghast when his instructor told him, if you don't pass all of your classes, I'm going to have to drop you. And so he had to go and start learning how to study. And he barely eked out passing all of his classes his freshman year. And what happened was, in three years, he became the undefeated welterweight boxing champion of the University of Kentucky. He graduated with honors and a bachelor's degree in psychology. He was the cadet colonel his senior year. He won the reserve officer's team medal for excellence. He was a member of the Scabbard and Blade military fraternity, and he was also an Alpha Tau Omega. 
He won the American Legion Cup, which read to the graduating officer, outstanding and possessing a marked degree in those inherent qualities necessary in the making of an officer and a gentleman. He won the Phoenix Hotel Cup for the member of the Advanced Reserve Officer Corps having the highest average in military science for the academic year. The governor conveyed to Marion the award of Kentucky Colonel. The mayor presented him with the key to the city. And then right after that, he and two other Army cadets were sworn in to the Army. However, the Navy and Marine Corps wanted him as well in his entire senior year, they held open slots for him to choose if he wanted to pick them. The Marine Corps had not op opened a slot at the University of Kentucky for 10 years prior. So he had 30 days to choose what he wanted to do. The night of his graduation, since everything has already been talked about, I'm going to go into a little more of the personal stuff. You, you, you know the other. The night of his graduation, he had some secret plans. And he, uh, he, f he fell head over heels in love with Martha. And it was the first time in his life that that had happened. And so they went to this special little restaurant nestled in a quiet little inlet on the Ohio River. And that after they had, they had the magnolia trees, he had everything going for him. And near the end of his evening, he got down on, on his knees and he presented Martha with a a nice little rock and asked her if he if she would marry him and at first my mother was so excited oh wonderful yes and then all of a sudden the expression on her face turned to total shock she says well I want to marry you but I'm only 16 and he goes well you're a freshman at UK what I thought you were much older and she goes well you know at St. Catherine's they kept moving me ahead because I exceeded my studies. Well, they drove home to um, the Kelly household, and they mentioned what my father asked for her hand, and, and he assured them that uh, they had to wait a year because Army officers could not marry until one year after they've been in service. Well, shortly thereafter, and of course the Kellys went like this, Whew, maybe she'll dump him. But he, uh, he chose the Marine Corps on July 1st, 1936. And uh, on July 15th, he went to Marine Basic School at the Philadelphia Naval Yard for a one-year course. Just as he was completing his one-year course and getting ready to head back to Lexington, where the wedding was already planned, he went to uh, his commanding officer and asked permission to get married. And he was informed that in the Marine Corps, you have to wait two years on active duty. Well, he had no idea what a social extravaganza this wedding had turned out to be. So he knew he had to tell Martha in person. So he goes back to Lexington and um, they had already had all kinds of presents delivered to the home. She was going to have 14 bridesmaids. It, it was a big social event, and it, it turned out to be the first time in his military career that uh, it was a near-death experience. And she admonished him that they were getting married on July 1st, the following year, no matter what. And so he went to his first posting was uh, at the Naval Gun Factory in Washington, D.C., where he had 300 troops to uh, teach the advanced training and also with the protection of the naval base itself. And one of the things that happened was that, uh, well, there were a lot of things. But my dad was a person who strove for excellence he always led from the front. And uh, if John Wayne had been a true persona, it would have been my father. 
There are all kinds of things in this book. It's the definitive book on night fighting, and the things that happened were incredible. So if you want to find out more about my father, please take your time and read that. Because when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, we had no night fighting capability, as was mentioned. And so he had to cobble it all together from nothing. And he ended up having the top night fighter squadron of World War II, like was mentioned. He had, his whole life was a, a life of excellence. He went on another 17 years in the Marine Corps, and much, it, much of it was top secret, eyes only, special access. He ended up having a dual career. And then his other military career was uh, top secret crypto. But on uh, another occasion, I'll tell you about a number of those things. Again, I want to thank everybody for tolerating me. Um, my father was, he was my hero. He never missed any of my football or baseball games growing up. He was always there for me. And he was, it's, it's the same for my other brothers. He was not only a, a fantastic military man, he was an incredible father. And my mother, just to mention one more thing about her, in 1957, when we were quartered at Pearl Harbor, my mother was the president of the officers, the Pearl Harbor Officers Wives Club. It was her idea that they should take on a project to build a memorial for the Arizona. And in 1962, when it was actually completed, my mother and father were invited back for the christening of, of the memorial and to represent Kentucky. So, you know, marriage and the, you know, both people, both spouses serve the military. It's not just one, it takes both. And so my mother was fantastic as well. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mark Magruder. <clears throat> For most people, the story of their life typically ends with death. It is a rare person after death who continues to inspire others. Our next enshrinee is just such a person. A Lexington native, Captain R.C. Underwood, was the last Marine aviator to be killed in Operation Desert Storm. That was in 1991. But even today, his life continues to be a model for others. Ladies and gentlemen, let's spend a few minutes looking at the life of Captain R.C. Underwood. The body of Captain Reginald Courtney Underwood arrived at Dover Air Force Base at midnight, March 12, 1991. He had been shot down over Safwan, Iraq on the last day of the Gulf War. It was cold and clear as they unloaded his remains onto the tarmac. There was no fanfare, no grateful public, and no press. Underwood had been escorted by his close friend, Major Ben Hancock. It was just Hancock and a few airmen to quietly and respectfully welcome back this fallen hero to American soil. Six days later, he would be laid to rest in his hometown of Lexington, Kentucky. He left behind a wife, Donda, and a five-month-old daughter, Anne, a daughter that he never got to meet. While this would have been the end of the story for so many, it was not for this Kentuckian. Reginald Underwood had led a life where he inspired others, and even after his death, he continued to do so. Reginald Courtney Underwood was born to parents Shirley and Patricia Underwood on August 2, 1957 in Lexington. He attended Lexington schools, including Clays Mill Elementary, Jesse Clark Jr., and Tates Creek High School, where he graduated in 1975. He spent a year at Western Kentucky University before transferring to the University of Kentucky, where he graduated. He learned at a young age that it was better to be a good person and to help others. He believed that you need to show people that you care. When he walked into a room, it was not, what can you do for me, but how can I be of help to you? His friends knew and trusted him because of his honesty and sincerity. 
They would say of him, he was kind, funny, adventurous, and always up for a good challenge. He was always up to something, and it was always something good. His friends looked up to him. They always knew that he had their back and would be honest with them. And because of that, he earned their loyalty and trust. Reg always strove to be the best at what he was doing, whether it was his studies, sports, or his newfound passion, flying. He had discovered the joys of flying and had obtained his private pilot's license during his teenage years. He joined the Marine Corps after graduating from UK and went through primary flight training at Naval Air Station Whiting Field, Florida, and then jet training at NAS Meridian, Mississippi. It was there that Reg was selected to fly the AV-8B Harrier. The Harrier was a challenge and you could not fly it unless you were at the top of your class. And as usual, Reg was at the top of his class. While at Meridian, he met a young lady named Donda and they were married after Reg graduated. She became his next passion. He would do anything to spend more time with her. He considered every hour that he could spend with her precious. They would talk about their lives together. He even talked about becoming a minister after his service with the Marines. Underwood was a man of principle. While sometimes quiet and shy, he was not hesitant to share his beliefs and was always ready to fight for what was right. For that, his fellow soldiers gave their loyalty and trust to him. After completion of training, he was assigned to VMA-331, the Bumblebees, a.k.a. the Killer Bees, based at MCAS Cherry Point, North Carolina. In August 1990, with the on-site tensions in the Middle East, VMA-331 was rapidly deployed to Southwest Asia on board the USS Nassau in support of Operation Desert Shield. Now deployed, he was still deeply involved to his family and to Kentucky. Donda would help by sending videos of Kentucky basketball. Reg would watch every minute. His fellow Marines would joke that if Donda sent it, he would look at a video of an empty Rupp Arena. Underwood loved to fly, and he strove to be the very best during these difficult times. He had an excellent reputation and earned every tactical qualification that was possible in marine aviation. On 17 January 1991, Operation Desert Shield became Operation Desert Storm, and his squadron flew combat missions from the Nassau. He flew nine combat missions before his last one. Underwood died on the final day of the Persian Gulf War when his AV-8B was hit by a heat-seeking Iraqi surface-to-air missile. He was the very last Marine jet pilot to be shot down and killed in action by enemy fire. He made the lives of the Marines he served with better and was a great example of character, work ethic, and devotion to family. Even after his death, he continued to inspire new generations to serve through his example of dedication to aviation and to service to his country. His ties to his Kentucky home, specifically Lexington, led to the local Young Marines Unit to be named in his honor. The Lexington Young Marines Unit was officially stood up in 1998. The Young Marines program is a youth education and service program for boys and girls ages eight through the completion of high school. The units are community-based programs led by volunteer adults, many active, reserve, or former Marines that live in the local community. When he was finally laid to rest, the whole community mourned the loss of a father, a friend, and a dedicated Marine. It is therefore fitting that Captain Reginald Courtney Underwood be enshrined into the official Aviation Hall of Fame of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Here to present Captain Underwood is Colonel Ben Hancock, United States Marine Corps. After Colonel Hancock completed Harrier training in 1987, he served with Marine Attack Squadron 331 and Marine Attack Training Squadron 203. He flew combat missions over Kuwait and Iraq in Operation Desert Storm. In July 1993, he was selected to fly with the United, U, U, U.S. Navy Blue Angels possibly the highest honor any naval aviation aider can receive. He served with Captain Underwood and was with him on his last mission. Well, good evening. That was a uh, great tribute to Reg there on the, uh, the video. Hard to follow that, but I'll, uh, it's not for me to be uh, here to speak on behalf of Reg Underwood and his family and friends. Uh, I'd like to introduce here at the table his, uh, his mother couldn't be here tonight, but she's still here in Lexington. Uh, his sister Alice is here, his brother Wynn, uh, 
Donda, his widow, and his daughter Anne are also here tonight, and good friends that flew with us together in that same squadron, Shane Tippett and his wife. Uh, Beth are here from Virginia, and then my wife also, you know, we came in from North Carolina to be here for this event. We flew together for uh, five years, for five years of my 30 years in Marine Corps was with Reg Underwood, so I got to know him uh, very well. We spent a lot of time as Marine deployed uh, both stateside or overseas in tents and, and small four-man staterooms. You get to know people very well, their character and what kind of person are. Reg Underwood was, was top-notch all the time. Uh, we did a, a med float together on a Navy ship, uh, then we came back, went to the Western Pacific for six months, came back from that, and on the same day, we were assigned to be instructor pilots at the only Harrier training squad in Cherry Point, North Carolina. We were there, safe and sound, flying Harriers and thinking about getting out of the Marine Corps when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and we were asked, not directed, we were asked if we would return to VMA 331 because of our shipboard experience and deploy with them for Desert Shield and then Desert Storm. So Red Jordan was a volunteer to do that. He could have stayed in Cherry Point, and he would still be here, probably retired as a Marine here in Lexington, Kentucky. But he chose, he stepped up to the plate when asked, and he went, he kissed his pregnant wife, Nanda, who was pregnant with their first child. Goodbye, uh, Pierside there in Moorhead City in North Carolina. We stepped on board the uh, USS Nassau, and we sailed uh, for the Desert Shield. And I spent, uh, he was in my statement with me and two other gentlemen. He was a weapons and tactics instructor, we call a Jedi Knight, uh, one of the finest. And as the video said, the hardest and uh, tactical qualities to achieve in the Marine Corps, Reg Under would achieve those very quickly as a young Marine captain. He was a skilled and gifted aviator, but also a devoted husband. And the video alluded to that. And the, one example of that real world cross country in Cherry Point, we took four jets one weekend bunch of young captains, myself, and Reg went to some, always went to Air Force bases, why? Because he had better bases than Marine Corps bases, so you never went on a cross country to do a, a Marine Corps base, if you could avoid it, and went to Air Force bases. So went to an Air Force base somewhere in the Midwest and flew cross country uh, training stories all weekend, then we headed back to Cherry Point in, in sections. Well, Reg took his young wingman back. I got back home, otherwise we were upset because Reg Dunham would have been home for eight hours already. And what have you been doing? Where have you been? Because again, Reg wanted to get home to his wife as soon as he could and spend time with her. Uh, and he was a devoted basketball fan. He loved the University of Kentucky. He loved his home uh, town of Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, after the Westpac, when we were instructing, we were sent back to 331. And after uh, we were at sea there for several months, we started flying combat sorties. And on our very first combat sortie we'd ever flown, we got engaged by a uh, SA-2 missile. I know General Henry seen those in Vietnam, large Russell mi uh, missile, missile that uh, engaged at 37,000 feet. First time ever flying in combat. We dodged the missile, dropped our bombs. We're feeling like pretty kind of macho Marines, first combat sortie, dodging a big missile, heading back to the ship. And in the North Arabian Gulf, well north of our combat ship, we looked down, we saw through the clouds a beautiful white naval hospital ship with a big red cross on it. I swear I saw Navy nurses down there sunbathing and drinking uh, iced tea and lemonade. And that kind of killed our manliness a little bit there, but uh, we were kind of humbled by that. Um, the last day of the war, when we flew all our combat sorties together, February 27th, uh, we had Marines on the ground, so you're gonna accept a higher risk when you have Marines and soldiers on the ground. And we went down in our single engine, single sea hairs below the weather, where we know it's high risk, Four other hair jets had already been shot down uh, prior to that day. And Reg followed me down there that day. I mean, he, he was willing to go down with me and, and put his life out there in support of U.S. Marines on the ground. We were attacking Iraqi vehicles and targets north of Kuwait City near South Juan on the Iraqi border. And weather was a fact. There were a lot of burning oil from the uh, smoke from the oil fires. And we got engaged by multiple service star missiles, and Reg got hit. And he uh, yelled, I hit him, hit pulled up in the clouds on fire, and uh, we asked him if he's controlled his jet to turn it southeast towards the uh, Persian Gulf, where if you eject over the water, the U.S. Navy's gonna pick you up. And uh, he said the jet was uncontrollable. And that was his last radio transmission, and I saw his jet come out of the clouds and nose buried and impact the desert floor. And we thought he'd got out, a lot of hope that he had gotten out of the jet ejected in the clouds and was uh, possibly evading Iraqi capture for several days. When they released all the POWs, the Americans and the Brits, 
he was not among them. And then his remains were found in the desert on the 8th of March. And I went ashore and uh, went to the remains to verify that it was Reg Underwood. And I was devastated, of course. I thought a lot during those several days of Donda and his five-month-old baby girl who had been born while we were at sea and he'd never seen. He had pictures of her plastered on his wall next to his uh, little rack that we shared in the little small room. And he was very proud to be a father and very excited about getting home and being home with Donda and his newborn baby girl. So I brought him home to Dover, Delaware, uh, and then to Lexington, Kentucky to be buried here. And uh, he was buried on a very, on a rainy day, uh, just like in a movie, a bad movie, with a horse-drawn carriage, as Kentuckians would do, for a fallen uh, hero. And the Commandant of the Marine Corps, Al Gray, came here and uh, attended that funeral for Captain Underwood. And uh, when they folded that American flag up, I'll never forget when he presented that flag to uh, Donda, uh, holding that uh, five-month-old baby girl. And I'll tell you this, the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life, which includes multiple combat tours well after that in Iraq and Afghanistan and other things I've seen and done in the Marine Corps, I would tell you the hardest thing I've ever done in my life was being in uh, uh, Pat Underwood's house, his mother's house, after I brought him home to be buried before the funeral. And when Donda came through uh, her mother-in-law's uh, back door holding that baby girl and I had to turn away, I couldn't face him. So I wish I could have brought him back alive where he could have been a, a, a great father and a husband. But uh, I'm glad that we got him home and buried in his hometown in Lexington, Kentucky. He was truly a better man than I was and I've never, I thought about that every single day uh, since then and I've never forgotten Red General but never will. And I'll say this on Veterans Day uh, for you young folks out there in particular. I know we got a lot of great patriots here and the honest, no doubt about that. For the younger folks in particular, if you want to thank a veteran, then be the kind of American that's worth fighting for or worth dying for. So I'll leave you with that, and I'll ask uh, Ann to come up here now. You can meet his daughter. Ladies and gentlemen, Ann Rhodes is now receiving the medallion inscribed in the name of her father, Captain R.C. Underwood, who is now declared to be duly enshrined in the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm so honored and, <laughs> and humbled to be able to accept this for my father, Reg Underwood. Um, I never was able to meet him, but I have been blessed to be surrounded by so many wonderful people who have told me everything that they could remember about him. Um, I feel like I know him and, and I feel like um, he was truly a gift um, to anyone that, that he was around. Um, sorry, I don't have a lot to say, but uh, I just am uh, in awe of of everything that he's done and and of everything that uh that uh that's being acknowledged uh, of him today so thank you very much for being here Ladies and gentlemen, as we close our night's program, let us congratulate the honorees, the Kentucky Aviation Hall of Fame Class of 2017, Dr. Gail Alexander, Major General Larry Henry, Colonel Marion Milton Magruder, Captain R.C. Underwood, 
and our Achievement Award, the Kentucky Chapter of the Association of Air Medical Services. Let's give them a round. Thank you and good night.